Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you guys don't know me, I'm Randy. Uh, I'm the worship pastor here. Uh, I just want to say welcome. Um, before we get started, what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask if you guys would just stand with me. Just stand with me. Just for a little bit. Just for a moment. I know you guys stood for worship, and I love that. Uh, we are encouraged by that as a worship team. That is, uh, participation is amazing. So, um, but I want to do this, uh, something a little bit different, uh, but just, just stay with me for a little bit. Um, and I want to ask you a question. And before you answer that question, I kind of want to let you know where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to ask you, um, are you here? Are you here? Not, are you here physically? Uh, but are you here in this moment, present in this moment, um, mentally here in this moment, focused on what's going on? Um, and if you are present right now and you are here right now, would you just say, I'm here? I'm here. Okay. I just want to see who's here. Just see who's here. Uh, we, have a, we have a privilege, and um, I'm so honored and thankful that we get to do this, to even just stand in a place of worship. Um, we got to um, experience our, our Fourth of July this past weekend. Fill the 
jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And they told them, now draw out some water and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. Then he called the bridegroom inside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. And now I used to think that this said, um, this line, this last line, but you've saved the best for last. But it's not what the word says. God's word says, but you have saved the best till now. You've saved the best till now. So today's message is titled, Your Best Days Are Now. Amen. Father God, Lord, I pray right now that as we worship today, as we get into your word today, as we fellowship today, Lord, that we are, uh, we are, are uninterrupted. We are, uh, we are focused on you and focused on your word and what you have for us this morning. God, I pray that as we dive into this in this moment that you draw us into your presence and calling in the now to do your will on this earth. God, we pray all this in your name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Your best days are now. Your best days are now. What are we going to do um, is that we are going to look at the way that Jesus lived. Not just the way that uh, Jesus taught and the truth that he taught, but we're going to look at the way that Jesus lived. And one of the most striking qualities about the way that Jesus lived is that no matter who he interacted with, no matter who he was around or what was going on, he was always present in that moment. It didn't matter what was happening. He was present, fully present. He lived with what I call an undivided attention in the moment. That's what he was. And in fact, what I want to do is I want to show you in two stories in the scriptures where it shows us how uh, just attentive he was to everyone around him, no matter what was going on. Um, And the first one we're going to look at, we'll find in Luke's gospel. And it says that Jesus was walking into Jericho. Now, if you can imagine, there were these large crowds all around. You can see uh, kind of this picture just um, depicts the walls of Jericho, these big, massive walls, and these crowds of people walking in. I just want you to get a mental picture of of these people walking in. And Jesus is among these crowds of people. And they're walking in. These walls would have been, this would have been about 1,400 years prior to the event of the wall falling. The, the walls fell, and they built them back up, and years and years and years went by, and um, they're beautiful walls. There's something great to look at, and Jesus is walking by this magnificent walled city with people gathered all around him, and out of the crowd, uh, this blind beggar named Bartimaeus, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so his disciples, they heard this among all the commotion that was going on. And they went to the blind beggar and they were offended that this person, this thing to them, would cry out to Jesus in the middle of all these people. They were offended at it. And Jesus doesn't have time for this guy. Jesus has got somewhere to go. He's got places to be, people to heal. Jesus is too busy. He has an agenda he's got to keep. He's he's too busy for this man. And so the disciples went to this blind beggar and they rebuked him for what he did, pushed him out of the way, got him out of there. And Jesus at that point rebuked his disciples and went to that blind beggar. And he engaged with a single hurting person out of the entire crowd, engaged with one single person who was hurting. And he said to the man, what would you like for me to do? And so the man cries out, could you heal me? Can you heal me? Please, can you heal me? I haven't been able to see since I was a child. Please, I haven't been able to see. And Jesus spoke this miraculous word of faith and healed the man. One miracle was that he healed him, right? And so that was an amazing thing that happened. The other thing to notice is that Jesus stopped for a guy that no one had time for. Nobody had time for it all, fully engaged with the person that was in front of him. And the second story, which is consecutive, it's right after this one. Um, It talks about how Jesus was passing through Jericho. It says in Luke 19, verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. He was passing through. He was going somewhere. He had somewhere to be, right? Jesus was entering Jericho, and at this time, uh, this man... Uh, was there, and his name was Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. Now, can you, has anybody ever just been going, so on their way to somewhere, going somewhere, passing through somewhere, I've got somewhere to be, and someone stops them and talks to them? They stop and talk to you, and they, and they just, they're the person that just really loves to talk. 
really have got something to say. My wife would say, that's me. But so you've got that person in your life, right? And so you're on your way to somewhere and you get stopped. And you're like, oh, hey. And you can't remember their name half the time because there's, there's so many people that you know, right? And you say, hey, buddy, how's it going? And so they talk to you and they're saying whatever they need to say to you. And you're like 12, yeah, yep, whoa, that's awesome, crazy. Man, that's wild. Oh, goodness. Gracious, yep, well, oh man. You're just, you're trying, you're trying in there, but you've got somewhere to be. That's where Jesus is at in this moment. Jesus was passing through Jericho, right? He was on his way somewhere. He had somewhere to be. And what's cool about this story is that Jesus in these two stories, I love how they're back to back. The first one is Jesus was interrupted by a blind beggar poor man. And the second time that he's interrupted as he's walking through Jericho, he's interrupted by a rich tax collector, which to me lets me know that Jesus has got time for the down and out, and he's got time for the up and out. He's got time for every single person. He's got a heart for anyone. It doesn't matter where you come from, the baggage that you carry with you, your past that you have, what you did, how you are living. It doesn't matter. Jesus cares about you. It doesn't matter what it is. And so Jesus stops, and this guy named Zacchaeus now, if you don't know who Zacchaeus is, I, I want to tell you about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. And he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Right? Yeah, good job. I, just want, I wanted you guys to start singing. I think it would be even better. It would be awesome. Now, if you don't know who Zacchaeus was, he was that guy. Uh, but he was a tax collector. Which, I mean, nowadays is a respectable job. It's somebody, you're making good money, you're doing something great. You don't want to really pay your taxes to the guy, but you're, you're doing it anyway because you got to. And you, you're a respectable person, right? Back then, um, it would be completely different because you would have to pay what you owed to the tax collector. And then the tax collector would charge you an exorbitant amount above what you owed and he would keep the rest of it and so that was who Zacchaeus was he was one of the most hated people uh, around and Jesus sees this guy and he calls him by his name Zacchaeus please come down for I'm what going to your house today going to your house you guys are so good you guys said good Sunday school teachers it was great good said great on them right Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. He invited himself over for lunch if I knew somebody in this place that was an amazing cook I would just say hey look I'm going to your house today. I mean, that power, that would, be, that would be awesome. Hey, I know you got stuff to do. I'm going to come to your house today for lunch. You cook good. I know you're good. I'm coming there. So Jesus invites himself over for lunch. Now, he's got somewhere to be, remember. He's going somewhere. He gives a no good sinner his full attention no matter what is on his agenda. And while he's talking to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus just breaks down and, 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 and this deep repentance. And he says, I've sinned so many times. I've hurt so many people, and I'm so sorry. I'll do anything I can to make it up. And you can almost just see Zacchaeus and hear it in his, in his, in his mind and in the words where he was blurting it out, but he still meant it, but it was just coming out. And he says, I'll pay back four times to anyone that I had ever hurt and that I stole from. And Jesus looks at this man and he says, today, in this moment, right now, salvation has come to your house. Jesus had an undivided attention in the moment. And he stops and gives people one of the greatest gifts he can, his full undivided attention. Can you imagine the full undivided attention of Jesus on your life? He's busy. He's got things going on. You've got a hurt. You've got a problem. You've got an issue. And Jesus stops what he's doing to look at you, call you by name, and give you every bit of attention that he has to heal you, to come to your house today, to save you, whatever it is. He is in that moment. He was always fully present in the moment. And I want to be like that. And unfortunately, I'm not a lot of times. Unfortunately, I'm not. And there are people in here that aren't like that either. That, that your mind is just somewhere else. There's a lot of things that we do in our life. Um, I'm married. I have four kids. I have a regular job outside of doing the worship here. Um, we do baseball and basketball and soccer and t-ball. And uh, we do a whole lot of things. We love to do a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, during some of those times, I'm not fully present. I'm thinking about the job that I have to do or, or the, the, the do out that I have for work or, uh, or what I'm going to do for the next week's set or um, the conversation I had with somebody on Sunday or that week that is just playing in my mind. And my, my mind is sometimes not where my feet are and I want my mind 
to be where my feet are. And that's what Jesus was like. He, he was where his feet were every single time he talked to anyone. And I don't want to just live for the happy moments, the up moments, the on top of the mountain moments, the amazing moments, the fun times, the great times. But I want to be in every single moment that we have, even the annoying moments. Everyone has the annoying moments. There are annoying seasons in your life. Don't point at the annoying person in your life, but there are annoying seasons in your life, right? And so you just, you have these times that you are just, you, you've got to be present fully. And I can remember, I still remember because it's still going on partly, but we have four kids and um, people would say, man, you must really like kids or you know how that happens or like all those things. They say these things to you, right? And so I'm like, yeah, I love kids. I love my kids, but man, I love my wife because she is the glue that holds everything together. She's the one that does everything for us. She is the, she is the power in our, in our relationship, in our kids' lives. She is it. And so for me, I come home and I get sometimes annoyed. I get frustrated. I get discouraged because there may be toys on the floor or there's a pizza Lunchable left on the table or there's, you know, a juice that's getting ready to fall off of a table or one that's already fallen off of a table, right? And so you come in and there's these things that happen. You're like, man, just someday... One day, I hope that I'm just going to come in and just, everything's going to be perfect, no toys. The boys are going to say, welcome home, Father, and let me take your shoes. Like, all the things, they're going to be, it's going to be so amazing. And um, Kirsten has to remind me, man, like, you're complaining today about moments you're going to miss tomorrow. You're, you're, you're wishing them away. Do not wish away our children's lives. Don't wish away the time that we get to, to enjoy with the toys on the floor or the clothes in the house or the food on the tables. Don't wish away those times. You're going to miss that one day in the future. And Jesus was fully engaged every single moment, fully engaged. Mind nowhere else but in that moment. Are you still here? You still here? Yeah? You still here? Say, I'm here if you're here. Yes? Okay. Listen, because statistical odds would say that a lot of you are not here anymore. Uh, Harvard actually did a study, and uh, it said, this is what they found, their exact words, was that 40% of the time, people's minds are not in the same place their feet are. 47% of the time. That's a lot of time. 47% of the time, you're in a conversation with somebody, and your mind isn't with that conversation. 47% of the time you're in church and your mind isn't on church. 47% of the time you're at dinner with your family and your mind isn't on the dinner with your family. That's 50, like that's almost half of your waking life you are spending not where your body is. That's a lot of time. In fact, one of the biggest grabbers of our attention is what? What? What do you think it is? Home. It's the biggest attention taker of your entire life. Right? It is. And um, if, you, if you're an average person, right, an average person that says, there's been studies that say you touch your phone 2,617 times a day. An average person touches their phone 2,617 times a day. That means while you're watching TV, you're reaching over and you grab it just to check it. Yeah, that's good. And you put it back down. Even not even doing anything, just picking it up just to look at it. You're in a conversation. I do this. I don't know why I do this. I just do it. In a conversation with somebody, you take your phone out of your pocket. You look at the time, you close it back up, you put it back in your pocket. Like, that's it. That's, I mean, that's a part of the 2,617 times a, a, a day. That's, that's a lot of times that you're not in the moment reaching over and reaching over and reaching over your mind somewhere else. Whatever's in front of you isn't what you're thinking about, the, the cat video or the argument that's going on. Whatever it is, that's where your mind is at. What's great about our church is that we have so many above average people here. They're so above average. You guys are so awesome, right? Did you know the above average person, the top 10%, the above average people, they touch their phone 5,400 times a day. 54 thousands of times a day. Can I just tell you, like, that's gross. Like, that's disgusting. Wash your phone. Wash your hands. Like, you, you, you go out and you touch something. You eat something. You pick up something else. And you pick up that phone and you got it to your face. And you're touching it on your mouth when you're trying to speak to text and it never comes out right. You're doing all the things with this thing around your face. And you put it back in your pocket with the lint and the crap and everything else that's inside there. It's just, it's gross. <laughs> we get distracted so, I almost got distracted there. Like, we get distracted so many times a day. 
you aren't with whatever it is in front of you, and your mind is somewhere else. If, if it's not your phone, it's, it's, um, it's games. Not just physical games on your phone or playing the PlayStation or whatever it is. It's games. Like, my mind will play games. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be just thinking stuff. I don't, you, know, you guys might not think this, but I don't talk very much. So uh, I don't talk very much when I'm in the car. Like, if I'm sitting in a, a group setting where people are all around and I don't have to be fully in the conversation, I'm just there. I'm just kind of just in my mind thinking. I'm still listening, but I'm just in my mind just there. I, I, and like we'll sit in the car and we drive and Kirsten doesn't really like to listen to music in the car. So I don't really talk in the car. So it's very quiet car rides most of the time. But I'm just in my mind and I play these games. Um, one of the games that I play is the, the win-then game. The win-then game. And I've done it for a long time. Win-then. When I get to so-and-so, then I'll be happy. When I get this, then I'll be excited. When I when I graduate, then I'll go to college and everything will be awesome. I'll be out of my parents' house. It'll be amazing. When I get a job, I'll be able to make more money. When I get a better job, then I'll be able to get, you know, even more money, a, a better car and a bigger house. Uh, it's the, it's the win-then game. When I, when I get the better job, I can pay off the debt, and that'll be even great because then I can do all the great things. When the kids are out of diapers, then I don't have to do anything. When I'm in diapers, then I might have to do something. Like, it's, it's all these win-then games that go, that go on, and uh, many of us, we're literally going through life wishing away the moments that we are in, and don't miss what you have now pursuing what you want later. Don't miss that. Jesus is engaged fully in every single moment. If it's not the win-then game, it's the what-if game. What if? What if this happens, then this will happen? The, the anxiety part starts to kick in. Not the excited win-then game. It's the anxiety what-if game. And that's been going on in my head for a long time. And so you just, what if this happens? What if I don't pass the test? Well, what if I don't pass the test? If I... If I don't, then I won't get a good grade. If I don't, then I won't graduate. If I don't graduate, then I, I won't go to college. And if I don't go to college, I won't marry the right girl. And if I don't marry the right girl, we might have ugly kids. And if we have ugly kids, they might need braces. And I won't be able to pay for the braces because I couldn't get a job because I couldn't pass the test. Like, what is going on in my life right now? That what if thing, it's, 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 it's just consumes you. What if this happens? What if the government takes over? What if all... Jesus says in six, Matthew 6, 34, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Like, like you don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. And Jesus isn't like anti-planning. He wants you to plan for your future. He wants you to have great things. But what he's saying is don't worry about it. I've got you. Don't worry about it. Tomorrow has enough to worry about. Don't, don't worry about that at all. So let me ask you again, are you still here? Are you still here? Because it's really, really important to be present in the moment, every moment. It's very important. Uh, when you think about how often we aren't fully present, sometimes uh, it's just we just are plain distracted. And as I thought about it, I'm like, why are we so distracted so often? And why are we not in the moment so often? And it comes to me that it's just a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith. The win-then game, the what-if game, all the games that we play, all the anxieties and fears and worries that we have, it all comes down to a lack of faith. We don't have faith that tomorrow is going to be a better day. We don't have faith that tomorrow God has got this. We don't have faith that the bill is going to be paid. We don't have faith that we're going to get out of the college. We don't have faith that we're going to make sure our kids are healthy and safe. We don't have that faith. It's a lack of faith. But the only way that we can be present in the moment is to actually surrender a past you can't change and trust God with a future that you can't control. That's what we have to do. You're worried so much about the past thing that you did that you can't let go of, and you have to surrender that to a God that can, that can wipe away and redeem every sin, every hardship, everything that you went through. He can redeem that, surrender that thing that you can't control, and then trust God for the future that you're going to have. Trust him. It's a lack of faith, man. We surrender that future to him because he's good. He's good in the future. He's good now. And he, if you are fully engaged with the person or which, with that which is in front of you, man, God will fully make your life exactly the plan that he wants it to be. God has a plan laid out for you. It's, it's beautiful and perfect and for you. 
Trust him. Surrender that to him. It takes faith. It takes faith to engage God in God's calling right in front of you. Whatever that calling is that's in front of you, it takes faith to engage God in that. I love how James phrases it. He says, come now. In John 4, 13 and 14, he says, come now. Everybody say now. Now. Come now is what it says. You who say today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such town and spend a year there or trade and, and make a profit. Come now. We're gonna, tomorrow's going to be great. You know, tomorrow we're going to move. We're going we're gonna to get out there. We're going to take all of our things, all of our, our things that we need to sell, and we're going to make some more money. We're going to do great. We're going to do bigger and better things. It's all going to happen tomorrow. I mean, you say you've got it all figured out. You don't even know what tomorrow's going to hold for you. You have no idea. You are not promised tomorrow. And he asks this question, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. You're a mist. I mean, if you think about that, picture holding a, a glass in your hand and just breathing on it. <sighs> that mist shows up real quick, but how quickly does it go away? That's what he says is our life. Our life is but a mist. It's here today and gone tomorrow. That image really gets me. Just thinking about how fast. I mean, I'm, I'll be 37 this year. I, I still feel like I'm, I'm 16 doing dumb things. Like, my life has gone by very fast to me. I've only got a little bit of time left. It's gone so fast. Your life is but a mist. This is, a, this is a picture of an hourglass. This is another thing that, that really gets to me. An hourglass. Hourglasses are kind of cool. There's some, uh, I was looking up some really cool looking hourglasses. There's some really cool hourglasses. I want to put one on my desk and just have it there. But there's some really cool ones. This is neat. But when you think about an hourglass, this is, this is a representation of your life right here. This is your life. An hourglass. And there's three things about this that are interesting to me. The first thing is, is that no one knows how much sand is at the top of it. You may think you know how much sand is at the top of that. And there are people who really thought that they had a lot more sand at the top of their hourglass than they really did. So that's the first thing that I think about. The second thing is that no matter what you do, you cannot stop the sand from flowing. It's going. Time is passing. Time is passing. Time is passing. You can't stop the flow. Today is a gift from God, and some of you are wishing it away to tomorrow. Today is the gift. The third thing is that once the sand is at the bottom, you don't get it back. Don't get it back. That's it. It's your life. It's here today and gone tomorrow. That's why at the beginning of this message, I had you stand to celebrate that moment. At that moment, we are together in the presence of God. We were fully focused on the presence of God and the word of God, and we were in the spirit of that moment. He was on us in that moment, and he was here, and that's why I wanted to celebrate that because we were experiencing God right then, right then and that now. And that's why David says, today is the day that the Lord has made. Because it's God's day, we are gonna be glad in it, and we are gonna rejoice. Today is is the day. If you're still here, and I hope that you're still here, because I want to tell you, you cannot be happy where you're not. You cannot be happy where you're not. You cannot serve Jesus where you're not. You cannot love people the way that Jesus loved people where you're not. This is the day that the Lord has made. The most important moment is now. Now is the moment. The most important person is the person standing in front of you in that moment. That's where your focus needs to be. That's the most important moment. And when I recognized this, I used to, I used to live for the, the, the big things. I want the big things in life. I want the, the motorcycle, the big car, the big house, the, the fun vacations. I want all those big things. Those are amazing, great things, momentous things. But I've recognized the most powerful moments that we have in our life are the small conversations that we get to have with each other. Those are important. Those are the things that I remember. I, don't, I have a terrible memory. Those are the, the things that I remember are the important conversations that I've had with people. The important moments that have happened in my life. Some of them are hard moments. Some of them are moments when I got hurt. But I remember those moments because I was fully in that moment. One of my greatest joys is 
in our passing times, in our, in our fun things that we do, and uh, the, hey, how's it going? How are you doing today, boys? What did you do today at school? Like all the things, those are great. But man, when I, when I get to this, this spot right here with my youngest one, he's five years old, he's tiny, he's awesome. He loves to say he's mall. He's, he's mall. He's just a small man. So he's a little tiny boy, and I get to put my hands on his hips, or on his shoulders, or on his face, and I get to just stare directly in his face, and that tiny little dimple is right there on his cheek, and I get to just ask him, you know, what did you need? How was your day? And he can tell me directly, to, and I'm so focused in that moment. That's the most meaningful time. I would take that over any great, amazing vacation that I could ever imagine. That moment that I get to just look into his eyes and fully see what he's trying to tell me or what he's excited about telling me about. Those are the moments that we need to be in. We do a lot of cool things, but those are those moments. Please don't miss what you have now pursuing what you want later. Don't miss it now. This is the day that the Lord has made. And if you look at the way that Jesus lived as he walked along, people weren't interruptions. People weren't inconveniences. That blind beggar man was not an inconvenience to Jesus. We see beggar people out on our streets every single day, and we are inconvenienced. We have to roll up our window on a great day. we got to lock the door to make sure our kids are safe. They are inconveniencing us from our lives outside of their lives. Don't make them an inconvenience. Ask them about their day. Ask them if they need a bottle of water. You've got an extra cup in here that you, you, they gave you an extra one at Wendy's. Hey, look, take this. Be in that moment, man. Jesus, the way that he lived, they weren't interruptions or inconveniences. They were moments and opportunities to engage and show the goodness of God our Father. That's the way that he lived, and that's the way that I want to live. That moment matters. This moment matters. Are you still here? This moment matters. And to be fair, I feel like I don't I want you to feel like I'm trying to make you feel guilty about being off in La La Land. I don't want you to feel that way because I get distracted too. I get ADHD moments all the time. I I, all the time. Right? And so uh, I'm working on that. And when you think about Jesus, though, if there was any time that he should have been fully consumed with his self, like we are most of the time, that he should have been distracted from others, from the things that's going on, and focused on him and focused on his father. If there was any time that he should have been consumed with that, it was when he was on the cross. And even in that moment, he still had time for someone. Even in the moment, when you think about it, he's the sinless son of God. He's placed on this cross with nails in his feet and nails in his hands. He's beaten to the point where he doesn't even look like a human being anymore. A cat of nine tails whipped on his back, pulling it out and ripping skin and flesh off of him. Organs hanging out, stabbing him in the side with a spear, crown of thorns on his head. He is beaten literally to death and hung to death on this cross. And he's lifting up and he's just trying to get a breath. And he looks over and he has a conversation with a criminal. The criminal at that point was was needing someone in his moment. He said, God, I'm so sorry. I've done so many terrible things. I don't know what else to do. I, I, I need your help. Please save me. Remember me. In that moment, he said, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And even in the middle of his suffering, even in the process of dying on the cross, Jesus was fully engaged with someone who was next to him to the point where he could save him in that moment. And he said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Today is your day. Can you imagine, man, the criminal's weight, not the weight of his body, but the weight of his mind. Up on that cross, I've done terrible things in my life. I've been a terrible person. I, I've stolen. I've killed. I've, I've, I've done all these terrible things. And in that moment, he just wanted somebody who was supposed to be the savior of the world. He wanted somebody to look at him and acknowledge him. Can you imagine us in that moment? Can you imagine yourself in that moment? You are literally dying, hurting, suffering. I don't know I don't know that I could look at that person and be like, man, I, I'm dying too. Look at me. Look what they did to me. You're
they're just hung here, but look what they did to me. It would be so terribly difficult for me to look at that man and say, you know what, I'm going to forget about myself. I'm going to fully engage with you and say, yes, you are a sinner. Yes, you are loved. And yes, you will be with me today. Man, how difficult. You see, I don't know who this is for, but you can't serve Jesus where you're not. You can't love people the way that Jesus loved people where you're not. You can't be fully engaged with someone where you're not. You can't be fulfilled where you're not. Your mind is not where your body is 47% of the time. You're missing out on the life that God gave to you. He gave you the breath in your lungs that morning. Wake up and use it for Him. Wake up. It's right in front of you. You you can't be a great friend when you're not there. You can't be engaged uh, with your children if you're not there. You can't be engaged in your marriage when you're not there. Until you realize that today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And because of that, my time is now. Now is the word today. Now in this moment, you get to experience his grace. Now in this moment, you can experience his mercy. Now in this moment, you can experience his forgiveness. Now, right now, right now is this moment. His freedom is here in this moment. Now, all his goodness is here. This holy moment. This holy moment. Man, if you're still here, I want you guys to pray with me. You can stand. But I want you to stay focused. Don't, don't look at the person next to you. Don't, don't start grabbing your phone and your purse and getting everything all together. Be in this moment still. This is still the holy moment. This is still God's time. This is still the moment for this church. In this moment, God, we pray, Father, thank you so much for your work. just for a moment and those who will say yes just like Jesus said yes in the moment the way that Jesus lived I want to love and live like Jesus did would you just say yes with me by holding your hand up I want to love and live in the moment like Jesus loved and lived in every moment man I see your hands everywhere in this place I want to be engaged in the moment that I am in I want to love the way that Jesus loved fully focused on the hurting, fully focused in the moment. Undivided attention in the moment. And if God is speaking to you and you want to see that as a reality, man, I I encourage you, man, say, God, I I pray right now. Say this with me if if you want to, under your breath, over your breath, out loud, in your heart, whatever it is. God, I want to be in the moment. I want to be in the moment with you. God, help me engage in every aspect of my life come into my heart and change what it is about me that makes me distracted from doing your will in this place God let me love and live like you loved and lived and I pray that you by the Holy Spirit would prompt us again and again and again for some of you today this moment may be one of the most important moments in your life. Others, it may be the very most important in your life. A change that can happen in your life in this very moment. When you are fully focused and you are paying attention to what God is doing on the inside of your heart, you may be gripping the back of that seat. You may be worried about getting out of here. Your mind may be racing about all the things that you've done wrong. I can't sing. I can't worship. I can't lift my hand. Someone will see and they'll, they'll judge me because they know who I am. May forget all that. In this moment, this may be the most important moment of your life. If you have not asked God to come into your life, ask Christ to be your Savior, I want you to raise your hand. You don't have to, you don't have to look around. Just raise your hand. I just want to see you. I just want to see you and pray with you, and I want to pray something with you. Would you raise your hand and you say, I am a sinner, and I need to be saved right in this moment. 
right in this moment. God, right now, I pray for those who are, who are in this moment who are saying, God, I need a Savior. Who are saying, God, I need you this morning. I need you to be in my life today. And God, I pray right now that you come into their heart and you save them. You take the dirt and the muck and the mire out of their heart and you give them a clean heart, oh God. Wash them clean, white as snow. A fresh start, God, to be fully engaged in every moment, God. A fresh start, a fresh beginning in this moment, right now. God, I pray for them in their heart, in their life. If you are far from God or maybe guilty about something, whatever it is, if you want to be engaged in the moment, if you've got something that you need to lay down, this altar is open. We would love to pray with you. We'd love to just meet with you and talk with you and engage with you. So as they sing in this time, don't be distracted. Finish out this day. Don't walk out the back door yet. Finish out this day worshiping our God, being fully engrossed in the moment as we sing.